Mesdames et Messieurs, Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. Welcome to this last conference of the Wright Colloquium for Science. And it's already the 20th ed edition of this event this year. It's a pleasure to see you uh, so numerous tonight and uh, also all along the week. We know that the 2020 edition was uh, uh, different because of COVID, uh, we had an empty room. Everybody was connected remotely. I would like also to extend my to greetings to the people online. And I'm uh, Olivier Desibo, I'm a journalist, and I will be the moderator for this last uh, conference and also the Q&A after the session. Every two years, we host here in Geneva a set of uh, scientists, experts from all around the world, and they've all led us in uh, a um, traveling around the Earth. We have discussed the four elements, uh, so fire, earth, water, and earth, but we've just added one life for tonight. As you know, there will be three parts to this uh, conference, or so first the conference, then a Q&A session in French and English. If you want to ask a question in French, don't hesitate. We have simultaneous interpreters with us, and they will be translating your questions into English for our speakers. For the people online, you can also ask questions using the chat box. And don't hesitate, we will ask your questions on stage. Without further ado, uh, tonight, we, it's an honor and a pleasure to welcome Nick Lane, a biochemistry professor from the UCL uh, in the uh, United Kingdom, and to present him, introduce him, uh, and also the book he wrote, because he has been writing a lot of books. I invite on the stage uh, Yvan Rodriguez, a member of the Wright Foundation. Good uh, evening, everyone. So, what would be more normal than conclude this 20th uh, Wright Colloquium that this year focused quite uh, broadly on the world that surrounds us by thinking about the living and more specifically the origin of life. This is indeed a fascinating question. And of course, it has been in the minds of our ancestors and still is a question that does stimulate our brains, the brains of the ones who try to answer this question using uh, their labs and vials, but also the minds of those who think differently through philosophy or religion. Today, we are welcoming someone who lets his uh, reflection being guided by science, by quantitative data. He dedicated an important part of his life to the understanding of the primary events that have led this small rocky planet to be transformed in this uh, culture broth that now hosts such different beings, such uh, as uh, giraffe, coronavirus, or plants. To come back to Nick Lane, he is a professor of evolutionary biochemistry for the genetic department of the UCL in London, and he also leads the uh, Center for the Study of the Original of Life and Evolution from the same institution. He has published more than, one, than 100 uh, articles uh, and received a lot of awards, and I will not uh, mention them all, except for the the Michael Faraday Award, you might know this prize, because it has a specificity. This prize uh, does uh, 
uh, recognize excellency, but also the communication, the scientific communication to the wider audience. And we know that this is a very rare quality in a scientist. And so it's an added uh, quality to, to describe Nick Lane. He likes communication, but he also writes very well. And so Dr. Lane wrote five books that are, were targeted to a non-specialized audience. So these books were very well appre appreciated because he sold more than 150,000 of them, and they were translated into 25 languages. Maybe you've read uh, him, uh, and Bill Gates did too. Nick Lane is one of his favorite authors, and his last book called Transformer, The Deep Chemistry of Life and Death, so really the exploration of what we could call the abiogenesis, meaning the origin of life, and I really recommend you to read the book. So Nick Lane will be discussing the different possible sources of life. By first starting from the uh, point of origin of disappearance of life, he will maybe discuss about the deep oceans and the hydrothermal vents as a potential source, such as others such as the sky, uh, hot springs, and others. As a detective, he will then explain some specificities, some physical, chemical uh, characteristics, energetic characteristics that we can see in the living today, and that may give us information and lead us on the pathway to find the initial state of great life. It is an honor to host you today, Professor Nick Lane. Nick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction, and thank you to the Wright Foundation for uh, inviting me here. It's an honor and a pleasure. It's been a fantastic week. I've enjoyed every minute of it uh, and learned a great deal. Um, so I am going to talk about the origin of life, but you may wonder how is it possible that we can know anything at all about the origin of life? And perhaps by the time I finish speaking, you'll think, well, we really don't know anything about the origin of life. I'm going to try and persuade you that we can know some things, but it's different to other fields of science. So in physics, for example, if we want to understand the origin of the universe, well, one thing we can do is have a, a large space telescope like the James Webb Telescope, and we can look to the furthest side of the universe, which is looking back in time, because the further away a star is, the longer it takes the light to arrive, and so we can look back in time by, and observe directly things that were happening close to 14 billion years ago. That's not something we can do on Earth. We cannot, there is no way of directly observing what the Earth was like four billion years ago. There are some rocks, there are fossils, there's bits and pieces, but mostly it's damaged and destroyed and there's really nothing very much to see. And actually there's a philosophical point here as well, that if we actually could make a time machine and go back four billion years and, and, and look for the origin of life, where would we go? And what would we actually look for, and how would we know if we found it? The answer really is, well, we wouldn't. If we found some, you know, some green slime somewhere that was plainly somewhere between a, a non-living system and a living system, is that on the direct path to the origin of life, or did it die, or was it never alive? How would we possibly know? Actually, we got the, the clock wrong on this one. This is only three and a half billion years ago. And this is a painting I like a lot uh, from Peter Sawyer of the Smithsonian Institution. And this brings the four, in fact, the five elements together from this week. The earth, the water, the air, and the fire. And also life, because you're looking at some life there, although not all of you will recognize it. Those kind of lozenge-shaped things in the foreground are stromatolites. There are still a few of them living today in Australia and other places, not very many. 
And they, they look a lot like rocks, but in fact, they are living, and you may never have guessed that. If you look at them more closely, they look a lot like rocks. You can almost think of them as a living rock, and if you look at them under the microscope, you see these cells. In fact, they're cyanobacteria, they're photosynthetic bacteria. But they look like sand grains. They're enigmatic. How can we know what they're doing? It's very, very difficult. There's, there's, there's few things in the universe more enigmatic than a cell because that's the wrong level to look at what life is doing. If we want to understand the origin of life, we need to understand, we need to look under the bonnet and see how that cell is working, what it's doing, what the machinery is, how it's living, how it's, how it's processing things in time. And we need to try to understand the principles that underpin all of this and, and, and make it simpler and try to see where it connects with the rest of the world, with the four other elements, if you like. Well, we look under the bonnet, we, 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 we look inside cells, and they are shockingly complex. This is why the origin of life seems like such a, a difficult problem. This is an E. coli bacterium in a beautiful drawing from David Goodsell. Um, now, a bacterial cell is about 15,000 times smaller than one of your own cells. They're, they're very, very small. And if you look at it even under an electron microscope, you won't see very much inside. And what David Goodsell is doing here is, is, is drawing the proteins themselves and the DNA. So, um, if you look at this, the yellow bit uh, at the bottom, that's the DNA, the, 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 the genetic code in this bacteria. The, the green thing sticking out of the top, that's a flagella motor. It's a rotating motor that powers, it, it, it rotates and it powers the bacteria around. These are extraordinarily mechanical devices that living cells use even on the smallest possible scale. The little purple blobs that you can see, those are ribosomes. They're the protein building factories. So, so if, you, if you were to shrink yourself down to the size of, say, a glucose molecule, it's about 150,000 times larger than you are. It's, it's, you know, it, it, these are enormous machines, and they make proteins. So a protein is basically a long string of amino acids, maybe two or 300, all joined up in a long row. Now, these ribosomes, they can do about 200 per minute, sticking them all together in a long, in a long chain. They're extraordinary machines. And this is the kind of the level of machinery that if we want to understand life, we need to understand how all of this stuff arose in the first place. The difference between, say, a bacterial cell that you can't even see with the naked eye and a dinosaur is probably closer in terms of evolutionary distance than the distance between that that you're looking at under an electron microscope, if you like, and the origin of life itself. The distance that we must cross from one to the other is a phenomenal distance. There's a huge amount of complexity, even in the simplest of cells. Now, that is a ribosome. It's about two million Daltons in its mass, which is to say two million times the size of a hydrogen atom. This is where all the action is really happening. We're, we're, we're shrinking down now to the size of molecules like glucose. So we're, we're, and, we're, we're, we're about, about um, 15,000 times smaller than, than the ribosome itself here. What you're seeing, it looks a lot like an electrical wiring diagram or something. It's not, actually. This is a metabolic map. All the enzymes, all the proteins in cells, what they're doing is catalyzing a reaction. One molecule changes into another molecule. And each of the little nodes in this is one particular molecule. And the lines connecting them is where an enzyme converts the, the node above, the molecule above, into the molecule below. So you could think of this as like walking down a street or something, that a car enters a street and there's a blinding flash, and the car, let's say it starts out as a mini or something, and it, it, it changes spontaneously into, um, into a Porsche. And then there's a flash and it changes spontaneously into uh, an Audi. And then there's another flash and it changes spontaneously into a tractor. That's bad luck. Um, and, 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 and it leaves the street as a tractor. That's a metabolic pathway. Stuff comes in at one end and, and is transformed all the way down this pathway and leads, leaves at the other end. And whatever comes in down at one end of the road always comes in as a mini, and what leaves in that road always goes out as a tractor. And you can do this individually for each of those pathways. It's an extraordinary thing. There are a billion reactions taking place every second in an, a cell like an E. coli cell. This is the level where life is operating, and this is where, really, if we're going to understand the origin of life, this 
is what we need to explain. And you can understand immediately why my, most biochemists back away and say, okay, we'll, un, we'll, we'll, we'll study how this system works, but forget about how it started. So, where can we even begin? It seems an overwhelming challenge. But we can always simplify things and think. And, and the, one of the most beautiful of thinkers was Christian de Duve. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize for discovering lysosomes, one small part of cells. And he, as a lot of Nobel laureates do, uh, go on to think about big questions afterwards, like, for example, the origin of life or consciousness or so on. Uh, and, and for a long time in biology, only people who'd won the Nobel Prize were ever allowed to work on something like the origin of life. It was banned, otherwise you were, you were, you were not good enough. Now things have changed. And they've changed because um, we can now build a tree of life using gene sequences, and it takes us back very close to the beginning. And so suddenly we can begin, normal people can begin to to ask these questions. But I like this quote from Christian Dudu. He says, how did proto-metabolism, so this is a kind of chemistry that's happening in the environment, in some environment somewhere on Earth, how did it come to be replaced by metabolism, this metabolic map that I showed you, or at least a little middle of that metabolic map? He says, the obvious answer to this question is that the appearance of catalysts, whether ribozymes, protein enzymes, or both, was responsible for the transition. So the catalyst is the is the protein or the, or, which, is, which is changing one molecule, this molecule, into that molecule. It's catalyzing a reaction, changing one thing into another. We have to ask how catalysts with appropriate properties came to appear. And he says the only scientifically plausible explanation, he incidentally was at the other UCL, um, the, the uh, Catholic University of Louvain, uh, and and uh, was, was, was grounded uh, in, in Catholicism, but was a, a scientist as well. Very. Uh, sympathetic, actually, to religion. There's, there's no necessary antagonism, really, between, between religion and science, and he worked on the origin of life. But, he says, the only scientifically plausible explanation is that the catalyst arose through selection. And enzymes, he says, are selected only if they fit into proto-metabolism. In other words, we've got, this, we've got this kind of chemistry happening in the environment, and what enzymes and the genes that encode them do is speed up this chemistry that was happening in the environment and make it better, make more of it, make it faster, whatever. It's improving what's already there. In other words, there was something there to begin with. And that's a hopeful starting point because we need to find it. So what I'm going to try and put to you is that life, in fact, is the best guide to its own origin. We, what we need to do is think about how energy works in cells, how metabolism arose and how, why it's structured the way that it is and where genetic information came from. These are the three big themes, if you like, in, in how cells work. There's plenty more as well, but these, these ones uh, I'll try and touch on uh, and talk a little about this evening. So, energy. This is a, a kind of a, 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 a scheme of what's happening in you right now. So, if you shrink yourself down and you go into one of your own cells, this is, you could think of this as a mitochondria. It's also, you could think of it as a bacterial cell. The mitochondria is where we're burning food in respiration, so the thing that's keeping you alive. And you can see down at the bottom, it says glucose, burning sugar. We're splitting it down by one of these metabolic pathways to a, a three-carbon molecule called pyruvate, and then it goes into this thing called the Krebs cycle. I've just written a book on the Krebs cycle. It's an extremely exciting thing, but it's probably the single most hated uh, piece of biochemistry that anybody who ever does a degree in biochemistry or medicine, everybody unanimously hates the Krebs cycle. And I thought, I'm going to have a go at getting it across, so that, you know, why it's so exciting. I don't, I'd like to think I might have succeeded for some people. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, so what's the Krebs cycle doing? In the simplest of terms, is taking these organic molecules, which are made from carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen only. That's it. And it's pulling out the CO2, and we breathe it out. We're expiring it. And it's pulling out the hydrogen, not as hydrogen gas. We're not kind of breathing hydrogen gas out. But it's, it's taking out the two atoms in, a hydro in, 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 in hydrogen gas, and it's feeding them. And you can see at the top there, it's feeding them into the membrane. Um, and, and it's passing them on, the, the, the hi uh, hydrogen atom is made of a single electron and a single proton. The electrons are fed to oxygen, and the protons are pumped across the membrane. So what we have, in effect, is a current of electrons to oxygen, coming from food, ultimately. And that current of electrons is powering the pumping of protons across the membrane. So now we have, the protons have got a positive charge, and they're all on this outside of the membrane. 
And that means there's a positive charge outside relative to the inside, which is, which is negative. So now we have an energized membrane, and this is the membrane inside all of your cells. If you were to kind of iron out all of that membrane in your own cells, you'd have about four football pitchers worth of membranes. And the charge on those membranes, if you were to um, kind of shrink down and stand next to that membrane, it's only about 180 millivolts, nearly 200 millivolts, which doesn't seem like very much, but the membrane is very thin. The membrane is something like five millionths of a millimeter in thickness, five nanometers thick. Um, and, and what that means is that the field strength, the strength of the electrical field that you experience if you're there, is 30 million volts per meter, which is equivalent to a bolt of lightning. So you've got four football pitchers worth of membranes with a charge across all of them equivalent to a bolt of lightning. That's what's keeping you alive. That's what we're doing with all our food. So that's how respiration works. And I've got there this charge, this huge charge on the membrane is driving ATP synthesis. ATP is often called the universal energy currency and, and it's used to make proteins work effectively. A protein, you can think of a protein as a slot machine and you put, a, you put your, 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 your coin in it and it goes and you put another coin and it goes and, and, and that's more or less how, how it works. You keep on putting money in spending your ATP, and, 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 that's, and more or less proteins are changing their conformational state to do work, and the work is being driven by splitting the ATP. The ATP is made continuously from the electrical charge on the membrane, and the electrical charge is maintained continually by burning food. So we're burning hydrogen in oxygen, which is, in effect, burning rocket fuel. So this is the ATP synthase. It's, um, it's a molecular machine, it's a rotating motor, it's an extraordinary device. And if we're thinking about the origin of life, then, well, we can, this is later. This is something which is a product of genes and natural selection and evolution. This is not something that goes back to the origin of life. But still, this is how the energetics of all cells work, so we need to understand what's a simpler version of this? How can it work in the absence of genes, in the absence of natural selection, and so on? I'll try to explain. This looks exactly the same, or at least it probably does. But there's a few things that have changed here. I'm now talking about metabolism. You'll find this layout in some of the most ancient bacteria that live on Earth. You'll find them in deep sea hydrothermal vents. You'll find them on land. You'll find them in coal mines. You'll find them in all kinds of places as well. What are they doing here? They've just reversed. The arrows on the Krebs cycle are now going in the opposite direction to the way they were previously. What does, I just said, what the Krebs cycle is doing is taking out CO2, it's taking out hydrogen, we're burning the hydrogen. What's happening here, we're bringing in hydrogen. This could be hydrogen gas. And we're bringing in CO2, and we're making the basic building blocks of all of life. The Krebs cycle intermediates. These are the, if, if you think of life as being um, carbon-based, it's made of carbon and oxygen and hydrogen mostly. Then there's nitrogen, there's sulfur, and all kinds of other, the phosphate. There's all kinds of other things there as well. But, but the basic hand of cards for carbon-based life is the Krebs cycle intermediates, these molecules, these carbon-based molecules. And from them, we make the amino acids that make proteins. We make the sugars that we um, make up partly nucleotides, the, the building blocks of DNA and RNA and, and, and the genetic code. And from there as well, we make the lipids, which are used for the membranes themselves. So this is the kind of the, the spinning heart of all of life, making the building blocks for life. And it's doing it from hydrogen and CO2. Um, and to make them react, you need a charge on the membrane. That charge on the membrane, I won't go into the details now, but it's also actually coming from the reaction between hydrogen and CO2. You need a lot of hydrogen, you need a lot of CO2, and you're doing everything with that. It's actually being called a free lunch that you'll pay to eat hydrogen and CO2. It's a very good way of making a living. And then genetic information. So I'm going to talk about all of these in turn, but the genetic information, where does meaning come from? Where does information come from? This is one of the biggest challenges and questions in all of biology. But there are some patterns in the code that I'll tell you about at the end of the talk, which suggest that there are direct biophysical interactions between amino acids, and I'm showing them here as kind of little blue or red lozenges, and the bases in, in, in DNA, the letters in DNA or RNA. There, there are direct interactions that just happen because of how much they like or dislike water, their hydrophobicity or their size and, and, and things like that. And if you have a random sequence of RNA and onto that you, you effectively stick 
a non-random set of amino acids that are stuck there because, because of the biophysical interactions that they're not random, then what you've, what you've got is a random sequence of RNA templates, a non-random peptide, which can do a job like catalysis. And if that is inside some kind of protocell, then there's no problem with the origin of information in biology. So conceptually, it's not necessarily difficult. Whether any of that's true or not, I'll let you judge at the end of the lecture. So, before I get going on those three things of energy and, and um, metabolism and information, I just want to give a sense of where I'm talking about. This setting of fire, air, earth and water that I think, well, anybody thinks, <laughs> really, gives rise to life. We have no idea where. I'm going to give you a, a, my own favored scenario, which may or may not be right, um, but I'll, I will try and present an argument for it. Uh, and, and it's down at the bottom of the ocean in these deep sea hydrothermal vents, where we in fact do have air as well, air in the sense of gases. We're not necessarily dealing with the atmosphere, but we're dealing with bubbles uh, that we were hearing about from Kim yesterday, and, 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 and air, water interface, and so on. So a lot of this can also happen down in the oceans too. Why do I want to be down at the bottom of the oceans? Why do I want to go down there? It's from the tree of life itself. This is a tree, a conceptual tree of life, done by uh, a, a towering figure in genetics called Bill Martin um, 20 years ago now. And, and, and this tree, if you see the top, it says eukaryotes. Where are all eukaryotes? We, so eukaryotes, euk the word eukaryote means true nucleus. So we've got a nucleus where we put all our DNA. So it's a, you could think of it as a kind of information storage dump that we put all the information in the nucleus. And then there's lots of other things inside our own types of cell. I said they're 15,000 times larger on average than bacteria. What you see in this tree, though, is that they're all at the top. They're formed by a kind of a merger. Two of these branches come together, one from a group called the archaea and the other the bacteria. The archaea look exactly like bacteria. You can see them down at the bottom there. They, they look exactly the same. They're very different in their genetics. They're very different in their biochemistry, but in their morphology, they're very similar. What that means is eukaryotes don't matter. If we want to study the origin of life, they're, they're, they're a derived domain. They're not relevant to the origin of life. We, can, we need to take ourselves out of the equation and think only about bacteria and archaea. Then we can look to see what did the common ancestor of the bacteria and the archaea look like. And the answer is, well, it was probably an autotrophic kind of cell, which is to say a bit like a plant cell, but it didn't need sunlight. It was growing from hydrogen and carbon dioxide, the kind of gases that we find in the vents that I'm talking about. And all, all the cells down at the bottom of the base of the tree are growing in that kind of way. Luca, you see right down there, the last universal common ancestor of all of life, very difficult thing to reconstruct. Bill Martin has drawn living inside a hydrothermal vent with two separate emergences of the bacteria and the archaea, which reflects how different they are to each other. And he thought, and I agree with him, that the, the common ancestor actually lived within the rocks, within these vents themselves. Well, when that paper was written, um, those vents, those specific vents that, that uh, he and I and other people now work on, had not yet been discovered. They were discovered a year later uh, by uh, Deb Kelly, um, who was captain of the Alvin Submersible. And she had taken it, she was actually going to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, um, where the black smoke events are, and most people are familiar with black smokers. These are effectively underwater volcanoes that Steve was talking about a little bit uh, a few days ago. Um, but these, these are a different kind of vents. They're not on the ridge itself. They're off, maybe 15 miles away. Um, and they're not smoking in the same way. Sometimes they're called white smokers, but sometimes they don't really smoke at all. There, there's a completely different process, and you can see that she's holding there, in her uh, right hand, she's holding a, a, a piece of lost city. And it looks like a, a lump of mineralized sponge, almost. And in, in her left hand, she's holding a, a piece of a black smoker. This really is a vent with a chimney in it. You can see the chimney, and these are the ones where the, the black smoke is coming, belching out. So these were discovered in the year 2000, relatively recently, this lost city. And they're formed by direct interactions between rock and water. So it's, it's, it's not a result of magma directly, it's not volcanic. Water will percolate down beneath the seafloor for distances of maybe five or six kilometers, sink down. And when we're close to the spreading centers, when we're close to the ridges, the mantle is thin, it, well, the crust is thinner and the mantle is closer to the surface than it is anywhere else today. And, and the mantle 
is rich in minerals like olivine, uh, which is colored green here. And olivine and water will react together. There's, there's ferrous iron, uh, so, so um, non-oxidized iron, if you like, in, 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 the, in, in the olivine, and it's oxidized by the water to, to rust, more or less. And that gives off hydrogen gas in large amounts and alkaline fluids. When I say alkaline, it's about pH 11 very often. So this is like caustic soda bubbling with hydrogen gas, pretty reactive stuff. And this is warm, it's an exothermic reaction, so these are buoyant fluids that bubble back up to at the base of the ocean. And when they arrive in the ocean, the chemistry of the ocean water is quite different to the chemistry of these hydrothermal fluids. And so they react together and precipitate out these vents. So the vents themselves are formed by the, the reaction between the ocean waters and the hydrothermal fluids. If we go back four billion years, the hydrothermal fluids we think should have been basically the same as they are today. Olivine was still the dominant mineral. But the oceans themselves, there was no oxygen then. And there's a lot more iron and heavy metals in the ocean. They were coming out of the black smokers straight into the ocean uh, and precipitated later on in great banded iron formations and, 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 and things like that. So we know there's a lot of metal there in the early oceans. And so the chemistry of these vents early on would have been quite different to today. Just to emphasize, this is a planetary scale. So when we have plate tectonics and subduction of the... Um, of the crust underneath the ocean, the submarine crust. It, it's effectively serpentinization hydrates those rocks. It's, it's binding water into them as hydroxides. And when they're, when they're subducted down, um, the heat and the pressure as we go down into the mantle is driving off the water again. It's, it's dehydrating those rocks. And the presence of water within the mantle is driving convection and melting the mantle and increasing the likelihood that you are going to have volcanoes in that region. And when we have volcanoes and spreading and so on, that is in self-driving plate tectonics on a planetary scale. And if we think about, well, what happens, is the water is being driven off by high pressures and high temperatures as we go down. But what about a smaller world like Mars? There's some evidence that there was plate tectonics on Mars four billion years ago, and there's evidence, quite strong evidence, that there were oceans on Mars four billion years ago that have been lost partly into space. But really, all of that water? But it may be partly that because it's smaller, it cooled down faster, and so less of the hydrated rock, less of the water was driven off again. So Mars may have partly buried its oceans as hydrated rock, and that's why we might now think of it as a, a dead planet. If there's any life on Mars, it's, it's, it's trace amounts of life probably buried somewhere down. There may have been life on Mars. It would be fantastic if we find it now, but it's certainly not a living planet in the way that the Earth is. These kind of processes happen on other, in other places within our own solar system. This is uh, Enceladus, one of the icy moons of Saturn. Uh, and there are plumes. The Cassini flyby found these plumes, which you can see there, jetting about 200 kilometers out into space. And, and uh, using spectroscopy and other methods, um, they were able to show that they're rich in hydrogen gas, they're alkaline around about pH 9, uh, and, and there's um, reduced carbon molecules like methane and some other organic molecules in there. Almost certainly this is the same process of serpentinization that's going on on Enceladus, um, and, and possibly as well on Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. So these are processes that can happen on any wet, rocky planet or moon. Uh, and, and, and there are potentially tens of billions of them in the Milky Way alone. One thing I'd like to say, I've talked about the structure of cells briefly, and the structure of the planet and the structure of a cell, in a loose way, this is not a very direct comparison, but they share a kind of topology, that the Earth inside, with all that iron in there, now, that iron is rich in electrons, you might say, and when it's oxidized, it's passing those electrons onto oxygen or something else. Um, so the, the center of the Earth is effectively electron-rich, um, and the outside, the oceans, the atmosphere, and so on, are relatively oxidized. And so we have a relative charge where it's relatively negative inside, relatively positive outside, relatively acidic outside, and in comparison, alkaline inside. This is very rough. Uh, but that's exactly the topology that cells have. What I'm showing on, on the, uh, uh, the right-hand side with the bacterial cell, these are the pumps in the membrane that are pumping protons out, making it acidic outside and alkaline inside. And the, the, the equivalent that I'm showing for the Earth, well, these are the hydrothermal vents 
So it's a little bit different in this case, but in effect, this is the mixing zone. This is where the, the, um, the, the inside of the Earth is meeting the outside of the Earth. Both of them, are in fact, are, are giant batteries. The Earth is a giant battery, and the cell also functions like a battery. And this is where the mixing is happening, inside these vents. They were predicted 10 years before they were discovered by Mike Russell. And this is a, a picture of him uh, that was done by uh, Nature, in uh, the, one of the top uh, science journals in 2009, if I remember rightly. So he, his ideas had gone from being not very mainstream, let's say. Um, a, a lot of science can be cruel, and um, I, I, I've read some uh, conference proceedings of Mike Russell putting these ideas to people in the 1990s and then being roundly rejected until the discovery of the vent systems that he was talking about and had been predicting. And then suddenly his ideas were taken seriously and became much more mainstream. And this, this picture, he's, he's been photoshopped up as Erasmus, the Renaissance man. Uh, and he's described as the Naissance man, Naissance as in the birth of life. And you can see he's got his reactor. This is at JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in, in, in um, Pasadena. And, and behind uh, a model of uh, a bit of a uh, lost city hydrothermal system. And to the right, you can see uh, a section of, of one of these alkaline hydrothermal vents. And I said it looked a bit like a mineralized sponge. And now you can see this is an interconnected set of pores interconnected pores. And Mike had described these as electrochemical flow reactors. We have, re we have effectively reactive hydrothermal fluids, ocean waters coming in, we have catalytic walls with iron and sulfur minerals in, in these walls, and a continual percolation and mixing of these fluids within, within the thing. And this is the setting that he has argued for 30 years now is where life originated. And, and for the last part of this lecture, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and make this case I hope I still have about 20 minutes left, do I? Good. So, energy flow. Here's a vent pore on the left and a bacterial cell on the right. They have the same topology. Just as a planet has the topology of a battery and a cell does, the pores do as well. So it's alkaline fluids inside I'm showing here, acid outside. And there's a barrier between the two of them. And that barrier is much thicker, and it's inorganic in these vents, so it's not exactly comparable. But they, in their topology, they are similar. That doesn't mean that they're related in any way, but it's possible that they might be, and we can think about ways in which, in which that might work. Now, the idea, let me just go back to that a moment, the pump, I'm showing a pump and protons being pumped out. This idea that respiration works by pumping protons across a membrane, it's a bit of a bizarre idea. I, I described it with the Krebs cycle and that we're all electrified. The electrification of the membranes is from the protons being pumped out. That idea was put forward by Peter Mitchell um, in 1961. This is from earlier, this is with Jennifer Moyle, who was his uh, lifelong uh, research uh, collaborator. She was brilliant in the lab. Mitchell was, uh, was, was a brilliant theorist. He was also slightly loopy, I have to say. Jennifer Moyle did all the experiments. Peter Mitchell won the Nobel Prize by himself in 1978, and I don't think that that would happen anymore, or I certainly hope it wouldn't happen anymore. Um, if it hadn't been for Jennifer Moyle's experiments, nobody would have ever taken Peter Mitchell seriously. But his ideas were, were, were brilliant. Weird. So there's a lovely quote from Leslie Orgel, who said, not since Darwin has biology come up with an idea as counterintuitive as those that say Einstein, Heisenberg, or Schrodinger. I love this. You know, I'm a biologist. I, I have some, of, some of the greatest heroes in science, are, they're all physicists. Why are they always physicists? But um, you know, as a bio, you know, I, 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 when someone compares one of the great biologists with a physicist, I'm looking up and thinking, oh, that's good. <laughs> so, why? It's a bizarre idea, having these electrified membranes. Why, why did it even come into his head? Um, and he was thinking earlier on, not about respiration at all, but a, a really simple things about bacteria. And, and this was uh, from a conference in Moscow in 1957 on the origin of life. Uh, and he said, I cannot consider the organism without its environment. From a formal point of view, the two may be regarded as equivalent phases between which dynamic contact is maintained by the membranes that separate and link them. So when he says organism, don't think of humans, think of bacteria, and think of the membrane as being the difference between the inside of the bacterial cell and the outside world, and the two phases of the inside and the outside world, and this membrane, which is 
you know, five millionths of a millimeter thick, it's, it's incredibly thin, um, is, is separating and linking them. And this, I think, is the key insight. And if we're thinking about the origin of life, it's so easy to get hooked on what is life. We give us a definition of life, and then we try and explain that. But before there is life, we have an environment, and we have phases, and we have, these, we have this structure. Um, and, and, and so before we know what a living system is, we've, we've, we've got this now as a way of thinking about it, where it's treating the, live, the thing that goes on to be a living system, or the living system and the environment as, as basically uh, equivalent phases. Here's what Mitchell was thinking about. If a cell wants to keep the inside different to the outside world, if it wants to be a living entity, if it's a self that's different to the rest of the world, it needs to find stuff it doesn't want and pump it out, and it needs to find stuff it does want and bring it in. Uh, and either way, it's going to cost energy. And in the case of protons here, um, if, you're pumping, if you're physically pumping protons out, what Mitchell really, and, and protons are really important just for maintaining the correct pH inside cells. So he was initially not thinking about respiration at all, but just about homeostasis of cells. How do you make sure you keep inside whatever you want and make sure whatever goes outside goes out? So he realized that if you're pumping things out, if you allow them to come back in, as you can see on the right-hand side, well, they're flowing down then a concentration gradient or a charge difference. In other words, it's going to release energy. It costs energy to pump them out, but it releases energy when they come back in. And if you can tap that energy, then you can use it to do work. And he made this leap from how bacteria keep their insides different to their outside to how human respiration actually works inside the mitochondria. That's the genius in science, realizing that there's a, a deep connection between those two things. And then proving it experimentally, while well, Jennifer Moyle did that. <laughs> um, it's really conceptually very simple. It's, it's a, a, no more difficult than a hydroelectric dam, really, where the protons are like the water on one side of the dam, uh, the dam is like the membrane, and then the, you have uh, the, 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 turb the electrical turbines powering, powering work. So it's not conceptually difficult, but you have to wonder how on earth can these machines arise in the first place. So down at the, the bottom there, I'm showing what I showed you before, an ATP synthase. This is the rotating motor that's, that's, that's making ATP. It's a product of genes and natural selection. There's no way that something of that complexity just happens spontaneously in, a, in the world of geochemistry. But the thing at the top, I've called it ECH, the energy converting hydrogenase. Well, that is a much simpler protein. And in the heart of that protein, there are some iron sulfur clusters, which I'm showing on the, on the right-hand side there. And there's a few of them. And these are like little crystals, nanocrystals, made of iron, ferric iron, ferrous iron, and, and, and sulfur. That's basically all. And they form, uh, well, there, there are minerals that have a very, very similar structure to this. So you can begin to imagine that this might happen in some kind of a an inorganic world, and it's driving, it's, dri it's, passing, it's taking the electrons from hydrogen, and it's passing them onto a, another protein called ferrodoxin, which has also got iron sulfur clusters in it. So we've got a theme going on here. All of these iron sulfur clusters are doing all the work, and we need the protons coming in to power that, and you can see it on the right-hand side. There's a kind of a, a switch, depending on whether there's a proton there or not. How does that work? What's going on? It's quite simple, really. I'll explain it using hydrogen and CO2 very quickly. Hydrogen. If you want to pass the electrons from hydrogen onto CO2, well, it, it doesn't really want to very much. It's quite stable. It's quite happy as it is. Um, uh, and it would rather hang on to its electrons. But if you, and, and CO2 also is pretty stable. It's a, it's a kind of a rigid molecule. It doesn't really want to bend or move about, and it doesn't really want those electrons from hydrogen. So what you're seeing there is an uphill reaction. It's not going to happen spontaneously. This is the first couple of steps of getting, high, uh, of getting CO2 to formaldehyde. It's not going to happen. But that's at pH 7, or any other pH you might want to mention. But what we actually have in the vents is hydrogen at pH 11 and CO2 at, say, pH 6 in the early oceans. Why does that make a difference? Well, because if you think about what, what, if hydrogen passes its electrons on, what's left behind are protons. And protons in an alkaline environment, they're right next to a hydroxide ion. So now we have an acid-based titration. They would really run to react together immediately. It's, you know, it's something that happens in nanoseconds. Um, so if, if hydrogen offloads its electrons in an alkaline environment, it really wants to do it much more. It's much more reactive. 
put hydrogen in alkaline conditions, and it will pass its electrons onto almost anything. It becomes promiscuous. CO2, it kind of wants the opposite. It, it picks up those electrons. It's now got a negative charge, and it doesn't want any more. It's going to stay away. Um, but if there's protons around, if you're in acidic conditions, you pick up the electron, pick up a proton, balance the charges, pick up another electron, pick up another proton. So CO2 is much easier to reduce. It's much easier to convert CO2 into an organic molecule in an acidic environment. So we have these two phases. Now you can see, this is also just governed by the Nernst equation. It's 60 millivolts per pH unit. It doesn't matter. It's basically now it's downhill. We have two phases. We have an alkaline phase with hydrogen in it. We have an acid phase with CO2 in it. We have a potentially semiconducting barrier between the two phases. This can do work. This can power uh, CO2 fixation, it's really potentially as simple as that. To be honest, we don't actually know if it's electrons crossing that barrier or protons coming the other way. It's quite complicated, but uh, it's conceptually not so very difficult. And we can do it. We're now talking about lab experiments. We're talking about a specific hypothesis. This is a microfluidic chip. Um, all this chemistry has to be done in strictly anoxic conditions. If there's any oxygen around, everything reacts with the oxygen directly. So this is an anaerobic glove box that you can see at the right-hand side there. Uh, and, and we discovered we used to have a, a less good glove box, and, and we, it leaked regularly, and we could keep most of the oxygen out, but you never quite get all the oxygen out, and then nothing ever worked. And, um, and I thought, I had all kinds of reasons it didn't work, and eventually we got a better guff box, and it turns out that the main reason it never worked is that there was always trace, trace amounts of oxygen in there, and that stopped it working. And now it works really well. Um, so this is just, I'm not going to go through the data, I just want to give you a sense of the kind of experiments that can be done with a specific hypothesis in a specific setting about a question that seems so remote as the origin of life. So we're, we're able to make formate, formic acid, and acetic acid, uh, methanol. So organic molecules are right at the heart of biochemistry, uh, and probably py pyruvic acid as well. So that's how the energy is working. It's just simply two phases with a barrier in the middle in this setting. What about metabolism? This is probably a bit intimidating, but don't be, because only a couple of things I really want you to see. Right at the top left-hand side there is CO2, carbon dioxide. And then this is, this is just everything which is in green on there, you'll see next to some arrows, it says CO2 in green. And it, sometimes it says H2 in green. And really all I want you to see is, is H2, 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 CO2, H2. All of this chemistry is coming from hydrogen and CO2 and pretty much nothing else. A few, we, as we get to amino acids, we're adding in nitrogen as well. But this is the heart of biochemistry. And the blue arrows show actually experiments that have been done in the lab. In fact, pretty much all, this is from uh, four years ago now, and pretty much all the arrows are now blue. We've, we've also, we, we've nailed a few more of these. In the red boxes, this is the precursors for making, for making the building blocks of DNA. Uh, so so the, 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 the nucleotides themselves. So you can imagine that this, this kind of chemistry, if you've got enough hydrogen and enough CO2 and you've got a, an electrical barrier which is making them react together, that you can start to do most of this biochemistry. And it really does happen spontaneously in the lab. I just want to give one example from our own lab, which has not yet been published, uh, of, of starting with what one of those red boxes and making the um, requirements for one, one of the bases that's in DNA. This is uracil. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through the detail here, but what you can see on the left-hand side is one of the steps. That's orotate. And on the right-hand side is the final step, uracil. This is one of the bases for the letters in RNA. Um, and, and, and this is a one-part synthesis in the end um, where we had, it works. The, cat, the only catalyst in here is copper sulfate. Um, and, and when we optimize the conditions on the right-hand side, you can see the, 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 the initial conditions at the left-hand side of that, that graph. And at the right-hand side was where we tried different pH, different temperature, different pressure, different salinity, um, all these things. And, and we, we, we grouped the conditions that worked best together, and we got about 10 times as much uracil by doing that under these conditions, just with a copper sulfate catalyst and nothing else. Uh, and the conditions that worked really well were really pleasingly basically alkaline hydrothermal conditions. pH 9, uh, 90 degrees centigrade, modern ocean salinity, uh, and, and uh, the pressure was 100 bars where it worked best, which is equivalent to a deep sea hydrothermal vent. So this kind of thing, it doesn't prove anything really, it just makes me feel good at the end of a long week. Um, and this, there was one question about that. 
This is copper sulfate. Copper's very reactive. Should react with sulfide, and there's plenty of sulfide in these oceans. And so most people would say copper would not be available under those kind of conditions, and they would have a very good point. Uh, so it was troubling, and we, well, you get what you get, and so, but, but really it should react with sulfide and precipitate immediately. So we thought, well, what happens if we just try with copper sulfide? And actually, we get more. I don't know the mechanism. It shouldn't have worked. <laughs> it just shows how bad my chemistry is. It does work. It works twice as well with copper sulfide than it did with copper sulfate. So there's lots of things you find out all the time. And one of the great things about doing experiments in the lab is you're proved wrong every day. It's very uh, grounding. Humbling, I was going to say. The big idea is still standing. The, 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 the hope that this is a, an insight into how our life might have originated and that the, this is the right structure is still standing. But the actual details, which metal ions are going to work, what are the conditions, all of it, uh, you're wrong on a daily basis and it's very good for the soul. Um, so you can imagine. I'm showing a pore in the hydrothermal vent here, and I'm showing the catalytic barrier, the iron sulfides in this barrier in the ancient oceans. And on the outside, we've got hydrogen ions, the protons coming from the oceans, and on the inside, we've got the alkaline hydrothermal fluids, and I'm suggesting that we can get through to this chemistry, the Krebs cycle type chemistry, and to make simple things, the lipids that make up the membranes and, the, uh, and amino acids. These are all thermodynamically favored and have all been done quite readily in the lab under these conditions. What happens if you make fatty acids? Well, I imagine that they may just form some kind of protocell inside. This is very convenient, isn't it? Uh, I drew it that way. Um, the kind of protocell inside this bent pore. And now we've got CO2 fixation and the Krebs cycle happening inside the protocell. Now, you can accuse me of uh, being over-imaginative here, and that would be fair enough. You could also say it's a hypothesis, and it's a testable hypothesis, and that would be charitable. Um, the idea is we can make now not just the lipids and the amino acids, but perhaps the sugars and the nucleotides as well, because now we've got an enclosed space, and, and, the, and the thing is, 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 is presumably the concentrations will be higher, and so on. So it's a hypothesis. Does it work? Well, the first question is, can you make protocells under those kind of conditions. These are quite extreme conditions. I'm saying they're forming on the alkaline side and the pH there is about 11. Well, it's a simple experiment. We take mixtures of the fatty acids and the, and the long chain alcohols that have been made under those conditions in the lab previously. It's probably worth saying they've been made in steel reactors and it didn't work in glass reactors. This is the kind of confounding detail that you often get in science. So we know it kind of can work, but we're not really sure if it really would. Um, but using, the, using the, the fatty acids that were made under those conditions, um, you can see there, this is, uh, this is, this is um, cryo-electron micros microscopy, uh, and, and those are protocells with, a, with a, a membrane around the edge. This is pH 12, 70 degrees centigrade, modern ocean salinity in the presence of calcium and magnesium ions that normally turn these things to soap. So it works perfectly well. And then you can see uh, with fluorescence microscopy, uh, at the right-hand side, that we get quite a lot of these, and there's some funky shapes there as well. They're not just all little spheres. Sometimes they're, they're long, extended things, and they move around. They, I'm only showing you pictures here, but they're, it's quite dynamic. Just heat currents in, in the environment mean that they fuse together and, and separate again, so they're quite dynamic. And we were, we were trying to think if we could... What would interactions would we get between amino acids and the iron sulfide minerals can we get something closer to the 4-Fe, 4-S clusters? So we tried just mixing them, um, and, and it didn't work at all. Um, just cysteine, which is a sulfur-containing amino acid with, with iron, and uh, so ferric chloride and, and, and sodium sulfide. Mix them together, everything goes black, everything precipitates out. And then we realized, hang on a minute, um, the only way that cysteine is going to get its sulfur to react is if it's lost a proton. We have to do it in alkaline conditions. So we try it again at pH 9, and suddenly, this is on the left-hand side, UV vis spectroscopy. Suddenly we see a shoulder. You can just, you can just see it there. There's a kind of, the, the, the way that that traces down, there's a shoulder there at 420 nanometers. That's diagnostic for 4-Fe, 4-S clusters. As soon as you see that, you think, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. We are getting the biological clusters that you find in ECH just by mixing a few ions together in, in alkaline water. Um, and and you, you, know, you can't leave it at that. We did a lot of additional work on it, and they really are. You really do. If you mix them up, you get 
these biological clusters forming spontaneously. And at the right-hand side, you can see they're electrically active as well. They'll pick up electrons and they pass on those electrons. We haven't made them reduce CO2 yet, but in theory, they ought to do that, and we're, we're trying to do so. I was showing a cluster there as well. That's the shape of these things. They really are like little nanocrystals. So amazingly easy, shockingly easy, to make these biological clusters that are responsible for CO2 fixation in nature just with a single amino acid. I'm showing one other thing here before I uh, go on to information and finish. Um, ATP synthesis, this was from a paper that was just published a few weeks ago. Um, and we're not, we're not doing all the steps, we're simply... I mentioned the ATP synthase several times. What the ATP synthase is doing is taking ADP and a phosphate and sticking them together. So now we have three phosphate groups in a chain hanging off, and that's what's powering work in biology. It's a weird way of organizing things, isn't it? Uh, and so, well, the question is, how would you do this if, you, if an ATP synthase is, is, is a machine that's coming later and we still need ATP earlier on? Uh, is there a simple way of making it? And what you can see here is there's a very simple two-carbon molecule called acetyl phosphate, two carbons and a phosphate group. In the presence of ferric iron as a catalyst, we'll give you about a 20% yield of ATP from ADP in water with absolutely nothing else there. And we tried a whole bunch of different catalysts. None of them, rest of them worked, only ferric iron. We tried at least 10 different metal ions. We tried uh, about seven or eight different phosphorylating agents, and none of those worked really either, apart from carbon oil phosphate a little bit. And then at the right-hand side, we tried... You can make it... Oops. We, 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 we can make ATP, but we wondered, what about the other letters in DNA or RNA? Can we make GTP or CTP or UTP? And the answer was no, only ATP. So ferric iron, acetyl phosphate, gives you ATP, but it doesn't give you anything else. And this is slightly crazy, it's slightly scary. Uh, it's, it tends to say the reason ATP is the universal energy currency is that it works under prebiotic conditions. It just happens spontaneously that way for reasons that we... Well, we, we have some ideas, but, uh, but it, it's quite freaky anyway. Right, for the last five minutes, I think I have five minutes. Um, I'm just going to talk about information. I mentioned already these uh, biophysical patterns in the code, and I wanted to show you that. I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time. This is really just saying, it could, can, can these protocells make enough nucleotides that you could have random strings of RNA inside them? So if anyone wants to ask questions, I can come back to that later on. But the answer in, in a word is, yes, it's possible. There are various catalytic feedbacks involving nucleotides, so a form of autocatalysis or just a positive feedback loop that allows protocells to make more of the building blocks for RNA. So that's all that's saying. That's mathematical modeling. This is what I want to tell you about, though. If we just assume that we're right, a bad assumption to make, but if we just assume that really life does start from CO2 and hydrogen under these kind of conditions, and then we look at the patterns in the code and we organize them around autotrophic metabolism, this core of metabolism that I've shown you, you can see this is the first letter. So the, the code in DNA is a three-letter code. It's called, it's called the codon. Um, so, so three letters encode a single amino acid. And there's quite a cacophony of... You, you could potentially have 64 different amino acids, but in fact we only have 20, and it seems like there's a lot of redundancy and there's a lot of mess in, in the genetic code, and it's not really clear if it's being optimized or if there's biophysical reactions or whatever's going on. There's also this temporal factor. This is the distance at the top is CO2, and, and each of these arrows are going into metabolism. And what you can see is that if the first letter is a G, uh, it's in grey. For whatever reason, the greys are coming earlier. They're coming closer to CO2 fixation. Then comes the, 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 the adenosine as the second one. So it's an A at the second position. And again, you can see it's structuring. It's close to the... Oops, close to the G. And, and then the, the Cs and the Us come later. So it's not just the number of steps, but there's, it's, it, there's a structure to that. I'm not going to attempt to explain that structure. I'm not sure I understand that structure. But plainly, that's not random organization there is a relationship between the temporal structure of metabolism and which bases are at the first position of the genetic code. This is the second position, and it's organized around what was at the first position. So at the, the, at the top left, there's a G at the first position, and then the top right is an A at the first position, and, and then we're looking at the second position, we're ordering them with hydrophobicity. In other words, for those top two, you can see there's a very clear relationship that the more hydrophobic 
the letter that's there, the more hydrophobic the amino acid. There's a clear correlation. So we have a hydrophobic base like A, and it's going to interact with a hydrophobic amino acid, like valine, for example. And, and so there's a clear relationship there. It's much weaker for the later amino acids. The, the top two ones are the first 10 amino acids that you would get in metabolism from CO2 fixation. So again, I can't explain exactly what's going on here, but plainly there is a pattern which is suggesting direct interactions between them. And this is the third position, which is normally considered to be basically redundant. This could be pretty much anything goes at that third position. And all I really want you to take home from this is that is not a random picture. There is order in that picture. And I'm just going to give you one example of it. So just below the, 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 the midpoint line there, there's two blue ones. One of them is, uh, is, is, it says glue, that's glutamate. And the other one says uh, asp, that's aspartate. Um, uh, and this is an inverted coton table. It's the opposite way around to the way it's normally shown, which is why it looks a little bit different if you're familiar with these things. So if you go in, you'll see that the, the, the first letter is a G in both cases. The second letter is an A in both cases. I'm struggling to read this myself. It's an A in both cases. And then in the middle, it says R or Y. That's a purine or a pyrimidine. And in effect, um, that's the distinction between them. And that, at the right-hand side, it depends on size. If there is a purine there, a purine's a big bulky thing. And the anticodon, it then has a pyrimidine which is much smaller, and, and the size of the amino acid is selected depending on whether there's a purine or a pyrimidine sitting at that third position. I keep hopping forward for some reason. But that's basically it. Do we know anything about the origin of life? I'd be really interested to hear, hear whether you think after this talk. I would say not much. Um, but we can understand the problem. I cannot say that life definitely started down at the bottom of the oceans or anything like that, but I think using life as a guide begins to structure it so that we can think about the questions, we can do experiments, and we can try to understand intellectually how a sterile, wet, rocky planet can give rise to life and a living planet that we know. We need to know that it's a long continuum. I said it's equivalent to bacteria to dinosaurs, going from prebiotic chemistry to the simplest forms of life. But when, when I'm saying life, I'm talking about DNA, I'm talking about molecular machines, I'm talking about ribosomes. These are sophisticated machines. We've got to cross that long distance. The proposed steps have to link up. You can't just... The problem with the field at the moment is one bit works in this environment and another bit works in a different environment and no one says, oh, well, do these two environments ever come together? Is there some way in which, they, you know, we, thinking about autotrophic origins means everything has to happen in the same environment right now. That's a big ask, but it is at least a testable question uh, and it may be that we can show it or it may be that we fail to show it, which would be, well, still fun. Um, so we need to demonstrate the viability of each step. I do think, though, that life has been almost a forgotten guide to its own origin. It sounds intrinsically circular, uh, but, but I think it can tell us a lot. If we can understand the principles, then we can begin to think about would life elsewhere follow the same principles? Are they there for a reason? Are these, are these you know, strong principles, or are they, did it just happen this way on Earth for limited reasons? I have to say thank you uh, to the people in my lab. Questions like this can kill a career before you've even started. These are big, difficult questions. You could easily go through a three, four year PhD without getting any papers. Everything can be negative all the way through, and that is a really bad start in science. So you have to be brave to do this kind of work. And they are doing fantastic work. Um, I, I only showed you a fraction of the data we've got, but they're really doing beautiful work. And they're holding, this was actually a, a, a couple of years ago now, as a birthday present, they're all holding the reverse Krebs cycle uh, and so I, I, I keep having to, 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 to use this, say, this same one. But uh, that's, that's uh, fantastic that they are doing this work and perpetuating these, these great questions and answers. Thanks to the funders, and thank you very much, and to the Wright Foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lane. Take a seat. The richness of uh, this uh, colloquium is uh, to be able to speak with uh, the speaker of, or of tonight, but also with the speakers, uh, the other speakers of this week, Kim Prather, Freedom from Blankenburg, and Steve Sparks. Please come and join me. While, we, while they take a seat, I would like to remind you that you can ask your questions in French or in English. And uh, 
the people who follow us online can also write their questions down and they will be asked to the speakers in the room. So uh, I'll switch to English and present the, the other guests we have uh, on stage with us, starting with uh, Friedhelm von Blankenburg. He's a professor of ge geochemistry at the re uh, German Research Center for Geoscience in Potsdam. We also have Kim Prater, Kimberly Prater, professor of atmospheric chemistry uh, at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography uh, at the UC uh, San Diego in California. And we have Steven Spark, Please, we have Stephen Sparks as well, um, Emeritus Professor for Volcanology at the University of Bristol in the UK. And of course, Nick Lane. I brought a, a little book with me tonight for you. And this book was actually written by a, a physicist. So as a physicist, not because it was written by a physicist, but because it was written on a question I will read in a, in a second. This book was written in uh, 1943, which is exactly uh, 10 years before the discovery of DNA. And this book from Erwin Schrödinger, so you might have heard of Schrödinger because of the cat of Schrödinger, but I won't speak about the cat of Schrödinger now. This book is entitled, What is Life? And this was a famous lecture he gave in Dublin in that year. And actually talking about books, in one of your books, The Vital Questions, you say actually, and it's a question to you, but also to the, to the other guests, that what is life is probably the wrong question. <laughs> so what is the right question then? Well, uh, the, 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 so I had one chapter in that book called What is Life, uh, and it is the famous question. Uh, and it's the question on everyone's minds, really. I think what is living is a better question because life is a process over time. You know, we, we, are, we don't think of it. We think of ourselves as an object, if you like. Um, but but you know, put a plastic bag over your head and you'll be dead in a minute. We are a continuous chemical reaction and that is powering everything. So it's a process over time. And it's that angle that Schrodinger was largely missing. Schrodinger was very interested in, he didn't know about DNA. You say it was 10 years before DNA. He thought it was proteins, in fact. And he thought it was proteins because JBS Haldane who was uh, one of the great geneticists and biochemists of the time, said that DNA didn't have enough variation in its, uh, in its structure to possibly encode all the richness of life, so it had to be proteins. And um, because Haldane was such an, such an eminence, uh, Schrodinger took his word for it. Haldane also, uh, a few years before that, 1929, had written a famous essay uh, on the origin of life uh, uh, where he coined the phrase primordial soup, that everybody's familiar with the idea of the primordial soup. I think he was wrong on that one as well. He was a brilliant man uh, and, and, and actually worked at UCL, which is where I am, so I'm very proud that Haldane was there. And a lot of, a lot of brilliant men at UCL at that period, and most of them were obnoxious. Um, there, 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 was, um, there was Sir Ronald Fisher, who, one, of the, one of the founders of the neo-Darwinian synthesis, a brilliant mathematician, also a eugenicist, a, really a racist bastard, uh, who, 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 you know, we used to have, you know, the Fisher Center, we've, we've denamed it recently, um, with some pain from a lot of people because he was a great scientist, but he was an awful man. And the question is, what do we want to remember about people? And I, I changed my mind, actually. I went from thinking we shouldn't, we shouldn't dename people to actually, yes, we should have done. <laughs> so, Are the, the guests, uh, looking at your prism, what, what is the right question to ask, um, talking about volcanology or you know, the relations between ocean and air or uh, the earth? What is the right question to ask when you talk about that? Uh. Well, I think one, I'll just take up one aspect of Nick's wonderful talk, and that was the idea that there, may, there must be a particular environment in which life evolved and or sort of the abiotic side developed. And I was just sort of thinking of two of our earlier presentations by Kim on the circulation in the mm -hmm. atmosphere and Ilka about the circulation in the oceans. Is it possible that actually the ingredients of life develop in multiple places, and then the ocean and the, the atmosphere sweep all the molecules that are formed in, on the ocean floor with, and mix them up with what molecules that have been developed by lightning or 
in a, on a terrestrial environment. So it's just a sort of question whether you, it has to be in a unique environment. Um, can I answer that quickly? Yeah, no. Nope. Oh, I don't need the mic, that's true. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, of course it's possible, and that will be the dominant view in the field. Uh, and it amounts to a heterotrophic origin of life, which is to say molecules are made all around the place and somehow they're brought together. Um, and it may be true. I can't say it's not true. I don't like it personally, um, and, and that's possibly blinkered on my part, but I think the key to me for, for, um, for what life is, is, is that it's growth. Growth is the, is, is the one thing that sets it apart, really, from, from most other things. Now, if you think about heredity in that sense, heredity is an exact form of duplication, of doubling. You double exactly what's the content of the DNA. But you also have to double the amount of DNA. And before that, we have to have ways of doubling the cell and the rest of the matter, the easier matter to make. And if what you're thinking about is an autotrophic origin where everything's in that one environment, we have a continuous through flow of, of fluids, and, and, and even if only a tiny proportion reacts, then we're getting, we're, we're getting the, the, the basic molecules of metabolism. Uh, and, that's, uh, and then the next nanosecond, the next one reacts, and, and so on. So we have a setting which is driving growth and organization and structural organization, which, I mean, I find it very pleasing. It doesn't mean it's right. Um, other people are working on the other ideas you talked about, so in some sense, it, I, what I was really interested in coming from my own background, is the electrical charges on the membranes, what are they driving, what work are they doing? And the way I've ended up is thinking what they're really doing is driving CO2 fixation, and that means autotrophic origins, and that means it must be in one place. Uh, and it's a very purist view, but um, a hypothesis has to be purist. Um, you have to say, I think this leads to this, leads to this, leads to this, and I'm gonna test those steps. Doesn't mean those steps are right. Doesn't mean I'm right. It just means that if the hypothesis is right, then this is what it predicts. And if you say, I want a bit of this and a bit of that and uh, something from over there, then it's, it ceases to be testable. It becomes just uh, enormously kind of large. And I think this is a problem with the field, that the, the, the chemists go away and they say, okay, you want, to, you want us to make nucleotides, so we'll do it under these conditions. They use cyanide and whatever. And, uh, you know, everything is a bit here and a bit there, and nobody tries to join it up and say, here's, here's how the whole hypothesis works. So I think that's what's been lacking. So I may be wrong, but it's, it's testable. Kimberly? Yeah, I mean, I guess my, my main thing that I was, you know, I think it's along with what Steve was saying is, you know, as I mentioned when I met you, all right, I was thinking about this prebiotic world and how people are thinking of being from the surface of the ocean, right? Is there one answer to what is like? I mean, could there be multiple? I think is, I mean, it seems like people are forced to, being forced, there's different camps. Am I correct? Absolutely, and those camps are not on speaking terms. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a really angry field. Any field that, um, that, that it's a big, Big important question, and there's not very much evidence one way or the other, and there's so many moving parts that you can't possibly really join them all up. And where people have dedicated decades of their careers to it and their entire reputation stands on their ideas, is going to lead to a lot of bitterness, resentment, anger, um, and, and, and you know, frankly, manipulation sometimes. So it's, um, it's kind of sad, but it makes me realize that what science tries to do as a method is to try to make people be honest, to try to make people take the personality out of it, to try to, to, try to be the best form of themselves, I think. Um, and, and, and that's something which it's easier to do in some fields than others, and it's something that, that I, I think in this field, I, I certainly want to try and set an example to my own people around me that that's how we should live, be willing to be wrong and be the first person to stand up and say, I I'm wrong, or maybe these ideas are, are wrong. And you're, you're quite right, there's plenty of other ideas out there, and it may be that I'm wrong on all, everything. I hope not. But. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, thank you, this was a, this was a brilliant talk. Um, and, and Steve, um, if your question, you gave me um, the keyword for expanding that question, I mean, all the, the chemical reactions you have talked about are all that, that promote life is mainly a source of energy 
which is like a pH gradient, it's hydrolysis, it's a redox reaction or something. And then, then you need some inorganic carbon, maybe CO2, and that's all you need, really. And those environments exist in many places in the world. Now, Steve asked the question, could life have developed multiple times? My question would be, would life then, wh why would it all have developed like four billion years ago? Wouldn't it still develop today, given that these environments exist? still in many places well, in the they're, world? They're not Do we the, know? Well, they're not the same. Oxygen, you know, this problem that I had with our, with our old glove box with tiny amounts of oxygen. And when I, I mean, we could measure. We're talking, you know, five parts per million oxygen was the amount that we were having in there. It really wasn't very much. Uh, and we got nothing. And, as soon, and I thought it was to do with the pressure of hydrogen. There were all kinds of things that I, I was putting it down to. Because to buy a new glove box is 50,000 pounds. It's not a large amount of money in the scheme of things. But I didn't have 50,000 pounds in my back pocket. I persuaded UCL to get, buy me one, which was very kind of them. Very kind for UCL. Um, and, uh, and, um, and, and, and now things are working in a much better way. So I have learned a serious lesson here, which is you really don't want oxygen around. And so life is never going... If any of these ideas are right, and again, I emphasize they may not be, but if we're starting with CO2 and hydrogen, then it's never going to work in the presence of trace amounts of oxygen. Um, so, so yes, it could have worked for the first two billion years, perhaps. Um, in which case, why don't we see multiple origins of life? And it's possible that we we could have done. Um, Darwin probably answered that best, because as soon as life has emerged from somewhere, it's so good at hoovering up all the raw material. It will spread around the world in no time at all, and it will be so much better at kind of proto-life at hoovering up all the uh, resources that I, I suspect it never had a chance to get going again. If it did, it may be things like the code itself, that as soon as you've got a, a universal genetic code, bacteria pass DNA around all the time by lateral gene transfer. And, that, and, and so if you're part of this system, you, 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 can take, you, can, you can adapt to a new area. You move over here and you don't have the genes you need, but you get this one from there and that one from here, and, and now you're okay, now you can work here. Uh, and, and so if you, don't, if you have a different genetic code, then you arrive there and you go, oh, you know, that's, that's it, you, you're gone. So it may be that there was selection in that way as well, that the dominant code won. But if what I was saying about the code at the end is right, we find life on Mars, Five years ago, I'd have said, no way would it have a similar code. Now, having <laughs> our own work, and this is not coming from me directly, it's coming from a student, uh, Stuart Harrison, I, uh, he's persuaded me that if we find life on Mars, it's going to have something approximating to the genetic code that we know for these biophysical reasons. I, I'm shocked at myself for saying that. I don't really find it <laughs> believable when I say it like that, but, um, but, but, but the, the results are suggesting that, and you have to believe what, what they say. And the problem of oxygen is that it would simply take over any redox cycle, or that it would re-oxidize any reduced organic carbon yes, immediately. Is exactly. That, or which of the two is the problem? Well, both of them. Both, okay. Yes. Okay, yeah, thank you. So I'll open the floor now to questions. There is one immediately there. Are there others? Yes, one here. So, up there. To uh, Professor Lane, you've, you mentioned a number of times CO2 fixation. Would you do a bit of your magic and, and get more of that CO2 in and keep it there? Basically, could you find a way to fix uh, climate change for us tonight? Uh, yes, in principle, yes. So, um, if, if we are... I mean, already we can split water economically by artificial photosynthesis and release hydrogen. So, I, my understanding is there's not a huge appetite for a hydrogen economy. It would require a huge restructuring of everything. But if we were able, and, 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 and it, uh, you know, there are people working on it, able to do what life does. The simplest cells living in these hydrothermal vents are taking CO2 and making, you may say, hydrocarbons uh, from, from, from CO2. Uh, and if they're doing it using something as simple as a pH gradient across a semiconducting barrier, then, then it ought to be possible to make it work economically as well, in which case, yes, we can strip CO2 from the atmosphere, convert it into hydrocarbons, burn the hydrocarbons, and we remain at least carbon neutral. That doesn't solve the problem that we have with pollution, with all the other aspects, and with far too much CO2 in the atmosphere already, so it's not a kind of single fix. However, it's, it will be a lot better than what we're doing at the moment, just digging up fossil fuels and, and, and burning them. So it's, it's a factor. Whether it can be done economically is a different question altogether. There's a question here, please. 
Thank you. This is a fabulous talk. Um, the hydrothermal vents, which are the environment that you've chosen, they're obviously competing theories with competing environments. How will it finally be decided which is correct? Is there sort of an Occam's razor that one is more elegant because one decided that, that what they needed for energy was um, some extraterrestrial event, whereas yours is more pure because it's self-contained? Um. I, I think, uh, was, it, was it Heisenberg or someone who said that uh, nobody ever changes their mind, they, that people just die? <laughs> so so I, I don't know. I, and I don't think that we will ever know the answer. This is the other strange thing. I mean, it's a historical question, how did life start on Earth? And it may be there's multiple ways in which it could happen. And it may have been that there were multiple ways and, and, and other forms just simply died out. We can never know the history because we can't go back and the time machine wouldn't work. Um, but what we can get is an intellectual framework that, that explains how, in principle, a wet, rocky planet gives rise to life, and it should happen on any wet, rocky planet. What we would need to do to persuade the field would be uh, effective experiments at every step along the way uh, that really it does work. And then I think that there was a, 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 there was a lovely phrase from James Watson when they discovered the structure of DNA. He said, it's so pretty it has to be right. This is far less pretty in the sense that it's far kind of more convoluted. But I think in the end it will appeal to our sense of, of, of beauty that this explains a difficult problem with the smallest, you know, you said Occam's razor, with the, with, with, with the most beauty and elegance. Doesn't mean it's right, but it's as close as we are likely ever to get. There was another question here. Is it still? Yeah. Merci. On peut poser la question en français? Can I ask my question in uh, French? Donc, professor Lane, um, so, Professor, aimé vos, vos I would have liked to enfin, know. Je suis un so, first, I'm a, uh, an astronomy. Uh, 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 I'm passionate about astrology, and I would like to know your idea on the fact that we found amino acids on different comets. So we found amino acids on comets. So what is the link with your uh, Experiments. Uh, so there is no direct link. Um, certainly it's true that there are amino acids on comets, and certainly it's true that there was delivery of organic matter along with a lot of water to Earth early on, and certainly it's quite feasible that a lot of those organics would have survived and would have then populated, if you like, a primordial soup on Earth. And, and these are ideas that are taken very seriously. There's no question that all of this happens. Um, I think that we then end up with the primordial soup again, and the question to me is, so what happens next? And the answer is, well, mm, yeah. <laughs> so, so I don't see it as the solution. It may be that there are more complex molecules that can be delivered, because even things as complicated as porphyrins have been delivered from <coughs> space on, on comets. So, you know, a, a, a more balanced view than I have would say, okay, well, this is going to circulate through hydrothermal systems, and some of these will be delivered to hydrothermal systems. The only reason I am not enthusiastic about it is that it, 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 it undermines the, the purity of a hypothesis that says all you need is these parts. If you want to disprove a hypothesis, then you need to have a pure version of it and try and disprove that. Uh, so I don't need it. Was, was it Voltaire who said, I, uh, sire, I have no need for that hypothesis, the God hypothesis? Um, I, I don't have any need for organics delivered from outer space. <laughs> Go on. Um, that was a very interesting, interesting question. Um, uh, if you had, I mean, we know that, that chondrite meteorites contain lots of, of, of yes. aromatic organic acid or com compounds, and, and if they were delivered to Earth, and they also survived because there was no oxygen, even at the initial hot temperatures that we have, then there wouldn't have been an, uh, a need to, to only evolve autotrophic bacteria. You could have 
begun with heterotrophic, those that just, just, just use organic carbon as their energy source, wouldn't that have made things much easier? Or why not? I, I, well, the, the main reason why not is that actually what you end up with is hundreds or thousands of different types of organic molecules. And what we see in life, it, we don't see hundreds or thousands of different pathways for breaking down single molecules at very low concentrations of different things. What we see is metabolic highways that make certain types of molecule that are found widely in the environment precisely because they've been made by life itself. And, and, and the pathways themselves, autotrophic goes one way, heterotrophic goes the other way. So the simplest explanation for why we see these metabolic highways is that the autotrophic came first. Again, it's just an argument. It doesn't mean it's true. It, but but uh, that's, to me, the strongest reason why delivery of organics, which would be hundreds or thousands of different things, is not going to work. I mean, uh, I mean, a, f a fascinating thing there, of course, is a lot of meteorites are made of olivine and mm. involve water, carbonaceous chondrites, and so they're actually serpentinization reactions in space. Yes. yes. So it's not confined to the earth. Um, uh, and uh, I think there's there's an issue that I just really just um, ask asking really about the geochemical environments. Um, you mentioned uh, sort of certain geocatalysts, like metals, like copper being a, mm -hmm. a catalyst, and nickel is important, and phosphorus is important for some of the some of the chains you described. And so you'd be looking for environments with which uh, allow those co those uh, those elements to be used in mm -hmm. the organic reactions, essentially. And although serpentinization does uh, fit quite a lot of those. I'm wondering whether it, there are other environments on Earth which fit and produce different sort of sequences of organometallic catalysis. And therefore, again, you come back to the possibility that you get, it, you, just by chance, you get the molecule you need, but you get it from space and you get it from a, a copper porphyry, you know, a sort of yeah. a, a land volcano and what have you. And then you, then the, then the atmosphere and ocean just mixes and brings them together and they, I mean, all, all it, they essentially help the diversity of the molecular world to create your, your conditions. All of this happens, yes. of course it does. Yes. Um, again, the question is how much of it is needed or how much of it is not relevant. Um, and the, the, the issue to me um, is if, if we, if you think about how selection is beginning to work, if you pick up one molecule, or if you pick up some molecules that are just being delivered in the ocean to you, so so how, how do you how do you accumulate them? How do you recognise them you, without without having genes, without having anything else? How do you get going? You've, you, a molecule is here. How does it get inside? And, and and now you grow a bit better because you've got this molecule that you wanted from the environment. So you make a copy of yourself. How does your daughter cell? get the same molecule unless it's lucky as well. So it boils down to luck. There's no selective drive about yeah. any of it. It's the luck of the environment. So how does selection start is a fundamental question in my mind. So the, yeah, go on, Steve. No, I, I, I was going to go on to another point, but I think I'll, uh, I'll leave it. To well, the yeah, for the matter of time, flowing. we'll take one last question from the, uh, from the room, and then I'll, I'll make a short conclusion. I have a very simple question. You, you talk about f making order in the form of your life system, and you've underlined that energy is necessary. Now, I was quite convinced by your volcanic vent arguments, but where does the energy come from that makes, allows this separation of charge? Uh, is it the heat of the volcano, or is it... It's gravity, really, in the end, I suppose, because the iron goes to the center of the earth under. Uh, well, it's under in the gravity. center of the earth. It's not doing anything. No, it's what you've got in. Well, the it's the. <laughs> but, but still, you're 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 partitioning that most of the heavier elements are going down. The crust is basically the the, the kind of frothy silicates on the surface, uh, and so you're separating an, a relatively electron-rich, relatively heavy metal mantle, and and obviously the core from a relatively oxidized exterior. So the the, the earth is a giant battery. Uh, and and the, the, the sun is oxidizing the, uh, the atmosphere as well. Hydrogen is escaping to space. And so and, and as soon as we have photosynthesis, we're splitting the water um, and, and, and oxidizing the atmosphere more. So photosynthesis is now supercharging the battery. The you're Earth's saying battery. your system works on photosynthesis? 
No, no, but that's, that's later and that, that will, yeah, that yes, will kind of I'm talking about charge the At the very beginning, we're talking about the origins. Yes. So we, we, we have basically a, a, a battery with electrons relatively negative inside, relatively positive outside. That's because the gravity took the iron down. It's a very simplistic way of seeing it. Uh, and, and, and so it's the planetary formation itself which will happen on any wet rocky planet which is uh, providing the conditions for, uh, for, for, for the origin of life, for serpentinization. So we, we've run out of time, uh, but um, I'll just like to make a, a short conclusion to this, this entire week. And I promised I would go back to this book, so I'll read to you this introduction. So the second paragraph of the introduction of the book by Schrodinger, uh, where he apologized of not knowing what to answer to that question, what is life? And this is what he writes. He writes, and then uh, I'll come to the question. And I think this conclusion relates exactly to the essence of the, of the colloquy. He says, he writes, we feel clearly that we are only now beginning to acquire reliable material for welding together the sum total of all that is known into a whole. But on the other hand, it has become next to impossible for a single mind fully to command more than a small specialized portion of it. I can see no other escape from this dilemma than that some of us should venture to embark on a synthesis of facts and theories, albeit with secondhand and incomplete knowledge of some of them, and at the risk of making fools of ourselves. So much for my apology. So that was Schrodinger in, in 43, 80 years ago almost. And you might know that the former um, professor here of astrophysics now at ETH Zurich, Didier Kello, Nobel Prize of Astrophysics for the discovery of uh, the, exo the first exoplanet. He's now building a new center for the origin of life at ETH Zurich, and that's his new mantra, to try to bring scientists together to together answer this question, uh, this quest of the origins of life. So what is missing there? And you pretty much described the same, that chemists are working on their side, etc. So what is needed so that together you all try to find an answer to that question? Um, I think what we need to do is, is be open-minded about being potentially wrong about a lot of it, which I have tried to do. I'm, I'm, I'm doing two things. I'm, I'm trying to say, here's my hypothesis and here's why I think that. And I'm trying to say it may be wrong. Uh, and I think other people with other hypotheses should be funded at least as much. Uh, I think what drives science is, it's a bit like natural selection. It's a bit like the, 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 the whole world. It's, there's competition and there's cooperation and they're both there. Uh, and ideas and theories and hypotheses compete in, in, in this and some of them are better than others. And some of them mutate to become more like the others and over time we gradually piece it together. I think the only way uh, to, to make progress is not to try and force everybody to change their mind and embrace a different hypothesis in a different setting but to try to empower people to, uh, well, be decent human beings and follow it honestly as far as it goes uh, and, and try to be charitable, open-minded and, and be the first to say when you're wrong. And I think then, then we'll make progress because, because you know, some ideas will die and others will mutate and, 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 and we'll get somewhere. I think it's a beautiful conclusion for this discussion. Thank you very much, Nick Lane. Thank you very much to the three other guests. And this is also for me the time to leave you, but before I conclude, uh, I would like to give the floor to the chair of the Wright Foundation to conclude this week of conferences. So this week, I've learned that for decades, we've opened numerous gates that we thought were closed before. And we did so with turbulence in oceans, with the fact that viruses are in aerosols all over the planet, also when we talked about prebiotic uh, biochemistry. And at the end of the day, we realized that with all the opened gates, there's a new world ahead of us. And so now we have the possibility to study so much. It's much larger than what we would have thought in the past. And so I would like to thank 
the speakers of today, because they've showed us these doors, these new gates where, to, towards new fields of study. And I think that for the youth, they've showed that numerous questions, way of thinking, effort had to be made. And this is amazing. And I'm maybe sad to be a bit older and realize that I will not be able to start studying the great fields of study you've just opened and laid before our feet. So I would like to thank our five speakers. This was amazing. I've learned so much every time. And I would like also to thank the men and women that have made this week possible. So Science Cup first, the people right outside that have showed experiments in several fields that really show the, uh, what they do. I would like to thank to our colleagues of the university, the ones that have given us the possibility to find the speakers, but also to build the agenda that we've offered you. It was not easy. It it's a role that is playing behind the scene, but it's because we have a great university that we were able to attract such great speakers that are really at uh, the core of their fields. And so, Yvan, that's, uh, I, I see you and I want to thank you, all, you and all your team. So thank you for moderating also these uh, events. Thanks to the security teams and all the people that attended to the conferences. I would like also to thank the people that made possible the recording of these conferences, the live streaming of these conferences too. Thank you to the interpreters that have made possible for those of us who do not understand one of the two languages uh, to still follow the conference. And finally, I would like to thank Fanon and Ascension. There's a lot of admin work that was necessary to make it, make it possible. And Fanon and Ascension were really the ones doing the work. So I want to thank them. And without uh, both of them, it would have been totally impossible. And I would like now to thank all the actors and authors of the show you can see on the Heart and History uh, Museum um, front. They make science poetic, even for those who, who d don't like science. They make science accessible to those that are not really ready to use their time to stay in a room like this to listen to these conferences. And thanks to all of you, because if you weren't attending, the, this wouldn't have had any sense to do it.